Why Come Japan? Welcome, everybody, to another edition of Why Come Japan. I'm your host, Mr. Radri, uh, on, here on this show where I interview creatives or creative people. Uh, but today on my show is podcaster, hiker, um, what, what other monikers can I give you? Uh, <laughs> Any others? Podcaster, hiker, and just normal dude, I guess. Normal I, I dude. I don't really... I, I, <laughs> As I've said in a previous podcast, I don't really do labels, but uh, you know, I, I am what I am. You know what I mean? So, yeah, do you do you? Yeah, do yeah exactly. And uh, this is the also the Lone Star under the Rising Sun podcast, and we're doing a joint podcast together. So, this is great. Saves on time. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it saves us from doing two episodes separately. So, indeed. Actually, no, I, I wanted to tell you this before we got into the thick of it, like the okay. thick of the interview. Sure. I, I have to say, you have like the perfect podcasting voice. Really? really? Like, I've, I'm not I've, heard, I've heard that from like so many people and I, I just, I, I don't know. I, I've never heard that before. So thank you. That, that's cool. That's cool. Well, let me put it this way. It's like if I had if I wanted to have somebody like to narrate ASMR type videos, you know, <laughs> you'd be perfect. You know, Ooh, it's like that's... I, I I feel very calm, you know, yeah, when listening yeah. to your voice. I don't feel this kind of like urgency or the sort of like. Mm. Um, it doesn't sound like like a person. Uh, a good example of somebody's like a uh, Gilbert Godfrey. It's not like one of those kind of voices, you know. Well, I, I'm <laughs> I'm really glad I don't sound like Gilbert Godfrey. That's uh, <laughs> I, I like Gilbert Godfrey, but uh, I. I would not want to sound like him. That's for sure. <laughs> could you imagine listening to his voice for an entire podcast? You know, I would listen to one podcast from him, and then I would immediately shoot myself in the head, probably. So, <laughs> If Joe Rogan had him on his podcast, would you listen to the entire thing? No, no. And like I said, I, I'm very selective with listening to his podcast these days. And uh, if I, I don't know, like I like Gilbert Gottfried enough uh, throughout my life to I would at least be interested in what he had to say. But God help me if I had to sit through three hours of listening to his voice. Same with like a Bobcat <laughs> Goldthwait, you know? Oh, yeah. That guy also has a strange voice. Yeah, yeah. So tell me a bit about your background. You're from Texas, and you've been in Japan for how long? Um, actually, I just celebrated my 10-year japan anniversary, if you want oh, to call Jesus. it that. Uh, two the weeks same ago. as me. Yeah? Oh, really? 10 years? Yeah? Well, almost 10 years. Starting next year will be 10 years. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I, I first set foot in Japan for my the very first time. Um, August 23rd, 2008. So, yeah, I, um, I've been here probably 95% of the time. I, I did go back to the States for a small bit of time, but I consider myself have, having lived in Japan for 10 years. So, yeah. Because yeah, I got here in 2009. So you've been here quite some time. Yep, I, I was here before smartphones. Uh, it, it's weird to say that, but, uh, you know. Um, yeah, right. I mean, yeah, you can say that. Yeah, I mean, like everyone had what they call now Garake, which is like the old flip flip phones that some old people still use. But, uh, uh, like, my very first phone was a SoftBank sort of flip phone. That that was that was a tough phone. It uh, There's a funny story about that phone that uh, I might get into later, but. I, uh, if it weren't for SoftBank, I, I would have probably kept that phone for a long time. It's it's weird that they call them Garake phones. Like it's it's like Japanese. What do you what do you call that? It's like it's Galapagos, and yeah. K means like as the way you open it up or something. Yeah, it's um uh, I forgot what they call like the shortened um version, but they it's it's not only borrowed. Uh, from the outside, like the guide I go, but it's also like um, uh, a shortened version of that. So, for example, like Jimi Hendrix is Jimi Hen. You know, like they they do shit like that here all the time. So, where in Texas are you from? I mean, um, I pretty much just say Dallas because that's the closest big city. Uh, oh, okay. If, if, if I tell people where I'm from, most people go, "Huh?" You know, because it's it's <laughs> such a small, minuscule town. Um, yeah. We do have some claims to fame, actually. And in 2008, uh, we had a, uh, a na uh, in the U.S. a nationwide news coverage about a UFO sighting. Um, of okay. course, in the, in the South, in in 
you know, in hillbilly country, you're, you're going to see UFOs. But it was, Larry King did a whole show about it, so that was that was fun. Really? Yeah, and uh, we're famous for pretty much having a nice high school football team 20 years ago and um, having a lot of dairy and then the UFO thing. Other than that, no one gives a shit, so... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. But I, I pretty much just say Dallas. But I've lived in Houston as well, and that I really enjoyed that city. So I kind of I kind of claim Houston as well. Mm. I see. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, because I've I've been to Texas before. I actually used to live there. Did and, you? Where about? Well, it was a long time ago. Before I had it, a memory. I was like four years old. So oh, okay. Memory of it probably. It was Do in you... Houston, I think. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. Was it Houston? Shit, I, I don't, I don't know. I have no memory. It was near the, uh, it was near Corpus Christi. Where is that? Is that Austin? Uh, no, Corpus Christi is kind of a bit south of Houston. It is on the coast, though. Um, was it Victoria? Do you live in Victoria? Maybe that's a, I'm not that's sure. A big spot in, in that area, Corpus Christi, Victoria. Yeah, um, I've lived all over the state, pretty much. But okay, yeah. How? Where? Where are you from originally? Uh, well, I was born in New York State, not New York City, yeah. the other New York, as they say. Uh, but I lived majority of my life in Colorado, Colorado Springs. Oh, man. That's if, man, see, if I ever moved back to America, that's where I'd go is Colorado. Oh, I, really? Yeah. I, I went there last year during the summer for 11 days, solo trip, and I just fell in love with the place. It was great. Rented a car and just drove around and fell in love with the state, you know? Yeah, I mean, especially if you're into nature, it's a great place. I mean, yeah. I mean, yeah. You're, always, you're always making podcasts about hiking, so. Yeah. I enjoyed it, man. It was, um, I felt, I felt uh, it was like a second home for me, just, just from being there for 11 days, you know, it was, it was great. Indeed. Yeah. But um, what's the, uh, what, I, I have a question though. What, what yeah, originally sure. brought you to Japan? What originally brought me to Japan? Actually, I was yeah. going to ask you the same question. <laughs> we we can answer both. Let me, let me ask you this. Sure. When you do your interviews, because you've recently just started changing the format of your show yeah. to where you've... Okay, before it was just you solo or you're talking, and now it's uh, you have guests. Mm -hmm. um, what prompted that? Were you just tired of talking to yourself? Or <laughs> well, <laughs> like to be honest, um, you know, until people started saying things about me having a, a, a nice voice for this thing, I, I honestly didn't think that I had quite a, a nice voice. Um, I, um, it got to the point where, you know, I, I used to make YouTube videos before I um, cleansed my channel. And okay. I, always, I always felt a bit, uh, honestly, I just felt a bit awkward doing videos, you know, so I, I was never really comfortable looking at a camera doing that. But for some reason, just talking into a microphone just feels natural to me. Um, but I just felt it was a little bit um, self-serving or self-centered if I just focus entirely on things I wanted to talk about. So I, I wanted to actually honestly showcase, my goal was to showcase other people who've come to Japan and what they do and what their motivation was for coming to Japan and showing people that there's so many different opportunities of things to do in this country. The image is, you know, come here and teach English or, you know, that there's like usually two images of Americans or uh, Westerners, sorry, Westerners in Japan. And that's uh, uh, English teacher or uh, in the military. And I wanted to actually showcase people who have come here and branched out and done other things. Not only, I mean, English teaching is fine because I still somewhat do that, but it's, um, I, I just wanted to show other people that, you know, if you're, if you're ever thinking about coming to Japan, you can do almost anything here. It's, it's, it's a, especially for a Westerner, your, your, oppor your options and opportunities are, are vast in this country. You're not just limited to one, small section in the job market, you know? Yeah, that's very true. I mean, I read a book one time called Freelancing in Tokyo once. Hmm. 
and they said the one great thing about living in Japan is Japan will pay you to get better at the thing it is that you want to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Like whether it is you want to become a better musician, like maybe you could play in live houses because I need somebody to play music or uh, just, I mean, just the various kind of stuff, like whatever it is you're trying to get better at, you can find outlets that'll help you uh, mold your craft, so to say. Right. And now with the internet, you can, man, like people don't understand. I, I think a lot of people don't understand the vast opportunity that the internet opens up for, for people to just do whatever they want. Um, how old are you, if I may ask? No, that's fine. 31. 31. Okay. Yeah. So I, I'm 33. So we're around the same age. Okay. And so you remember a time before the internet was really big. Yeah. Maybe even before. Like, do you remember like getting your first computer and hooking up to the internet and all that stuff, right? Yeah. And you had to like yeah. use a phone and everything. Yeah. Yeah. Tell so get off the phone. Yeah. yeah so we, co we come from a time where we were, we remember time pre internet. Obviously, the internet was around, but it, it wasn't mainstream. But we remember a time pre-internet, and we remember a time... We, we, we pretty much grew up when the internet was becoming important in the world. And now it's... You can't, you can't imagine a world without the internet, right? Oh, so, yeah, it's ubiquitous, you know? Right. So, for me, it's such a cool thing that you can... Like, for me, it's, it, the internet is such an awesome thing because... Um, of what it has become, you know, and, and younger people who've grown up with just having the internet already in its kind of current state don't really get that. You know what I mean? So like the opportunities are out there to just do anything you want. And it, it's, it's opened up so much um, for a lot of people, I think. Yeah. It's become a really interesting beast the last couple of years. Oh yeah. Definitely yeah. evolved into a, Strange thing, I can say that much. <laughs> yeah, I um, I would agree with you on that. It's it's um, it's kind of become its own entity in a way, you know. Like we, I, not to say that we've ever really controlled it, but there are people who have realized of what it's become, and they're trying to control it now. You know, with um, in, in at least in the U.S. with the recent uh, net neutrality thing, and you know. Uh, there's there's just so many people who one either understand its power of what it can do and want to keep it that way or two don't want to keep it that way and want to control it for themselves and control the flow of information for people so mm -hmm. mm. all right so I, I was doing some research while i was uh oh actually that brings me up another question i wanted to ask you yeah so, so when you do these interviews do you just start talking or do you like have a script or do you <laughs> No, I uh, I don't have a script at all. I uh, I pretty much I have a set of uh, like a format that I that I want to follow, but okay. it's, it's a very loose format. So basically, I just want to get into the mind of the guest. Number one, when they came to Japan. Number two, why they came to Japan. Kind of like your um, your concept, but then. Uh, you know, number three, and what they what they do now, and how they came to do what they do now in Japan, and it doesn't matter if they've been here one year or ten years. I just I want to see what their journey was, and uh, like I discussed with a previous guest, um, you know, I feel everyone who's an expat in Japan, and actually just an expat anywhere in the world, we all can kind of relate in some way. You know, it doesn't matter what any sort of political or religious or any sort of views you have in that regard. You can relate to an expat in some way because they have a bit of a free spirit and, and vagabond sort of feeling. You know, they, they want to travel somewhere. They want to get away from what they were used to. And uh, I always find that fascinating, like the reason why people do the things that they do. You know, so that's that's kind of basically how I go about it and wherever the conversation goes after that is I leave it really up to the guests. I just want to let the guests um, talk about themselves and, and you know, what, what their motivations for doing what they do are, you know, I guess I, I've just always been really interested in human psychology that way. 
Yeah, yeah. Did you study psychology in college? Um, not as a major or minor, but I took a lot of psychology classes as, um, what do you call it? Um, what, what's the extra classes you can take just to get credits? What uh, was that called? Mandatory oh. classes? I don't know. Not, not mandatory. Oh. They're not mandatory. Or? But you take them to um, to supplement the rest of your, to like fill out the rest of your curriculum. Uh, uh, it's, it's been so long uh, since I've been Curriculum in... core classes. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Well, anyway, I, um, I, outside of my core classes that I was required to take, I just filled them up with psychology and political science and, you know, things that I was interested in, you know, those type of classes. I see. Well, like, because usually when you go to Japan, they, like, especially if you want to get, like, an English job, kind of like as a starter job before you move yeah. on to other things, they usually want, like, a degree of some kind. I studied communications, so yeah. that was good um, enough. I mean, I, you can get a degree, pretty much anything, they'll, we'll take you. So. In Japan, yeah, that that's the thing that, you know, a lot of people don't realize is you don't need an English certification or anything to, to get an English teaching job in this country. You just need a college degree, pretty much. And then in some cases, you don't even really need that. It's, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend you try to do it because you're, you're in for, you know, a, a harder struggle to get into this country, but you know, it is possible, but having an English or sorry, having a, a college degree is really all that's required for you to, uh, to get a job here in Japan. Um, native English speaker also helps as well. If, if that's what you're going for. What did you major in? Uh, I started off with computer science programming, really? okay. and I I was never a good uh, math student at all. I mm -hmm. I um, I just got those out of the way. Got my got my solid B in college algebra, and said, <laughs> "Forget the rest of that," you know. But yeah. then I, when I started really getting into programming, I realized. Yeah, a lot of logic and, and, and math is kind of required for to, you know, to just kind of follow it. So instead of, this is the mistake I made there was instead of actually just putting my nose down and, and saying, you know, forget that I hate it and just do it so I can get better at something that I do like. I just gave it all up and I switched to another topic that I like and that's history. So I switched to a history degree. Come to find out that's pretty much a useless degree unless you want to be a history teacher or work at a museum. And or I a lawyer. Or, yeah, um, which I never considered that, but history teacher and a museum curator, neither of those <laughs> sounded very in in interesting to me at all. So I said, well, I, after I graduated, I said, now what do I do, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, no, I, I had a bit big interest in history as well. I almost majored in it, but I, I kind of wanted to graduate, so I didn't do it. <laughs> yeah, man. For me, history was just a gimme thing. Like I could just sit in the in the in the class, not take a single note, and just absorb what the professor was saying and ace the tests. You know, the essay tests at the end of the semester. Um, that's just how interested I was in the in the subject. You like never took any notes or anything? Not in my history courses, no. In in other courses I did um so I could study, but history I just I pretty much just listened in the yeah, board. Yeah, uh, that is true. I remember we had this one student in our class and our teacher referred to him as John the Tutor and he had like this crazy hair. Huh. And he never took any notes. He just sat there and listened very attentively. It was yeah. almost kinda like it was he was very studious, yet creepy. <laughs> but um studious at creepy I, I can probably recall both. you know several people that i went to college with that that were like that so yeah but like not creepy to the point where like he's unapproachable mm. just sort of like oh this guy's a little strange yeah oh, okay <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying that's you i'm just saying that yeah. you know um like when i think of people who don't actively like take notes in class and they're very intent and they're listening like either one, their listening skills are really, really good because like you're you're an English teacher, right? You yeah. Um, you do I, a Kiowa or what? What's your background? Well, right now I manage two schools. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, so I, I've kind of started filling in that role, but I'll still occasionally um, teach some lessons. So, mm -hmm. um, kids and adults. 
So yeah, but I that's what I started off doing was was English teaching. So that's um that's how I got my start here. And that's what I've evolved into doing what I do now is uh into managing schools. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, no, I was just gonna bring up that uh sometimes like when you when you're like you're teaching kids a lot of the times they're just they're not paying attention to you like even maybe even adults too yeah mm. <laughs> yeah so it's just sometimes like whenever i meet somebody who 100 percent listens to like what i'm saying i'm almost kind of shocked almost yeah. but uh i mean i'm not saying that they shouldn't do that it's just um i i do feel like I'm, i have a presence in the room which which feels rewarding in a way but yeah, for, for me, it, it, being an English teacher was the last thing I ever thought I would be. Well, when I say English teacher, let, let's make it very clear. Uh, a lot of English teaching in Japan is is not like English teaching that you would understand in, you know, back home. Um, what I kind of focus on is getting my students to speak. That's uh, how right. I approach English teaching. So I try and limit the amount of time that I speak in the class as much as possible only to facilitate their conversation. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. so, um, that's, that's my philosophy in it anyway. So, um, yeah, usually asking like open-ended questions and, yeah. uh, ones that don't have yes or no answers. And yeah. It can be a challenge sometimes. I mean, like I was so used to living in America for a long time where, just the people they won't stop talking or they <laughs> well not not to be negative i shouldn't be negative but i'm just to the point where like they knew how to carry a conversation even though they didn't know they were carrying a conversation really well what what i've come to understand is americans especially do not like awkward silences but okay. other cultures are okay with that and that's just something that i still don't like, but I've I have to un, I have to understand that some cultures are okay with 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 silence sometimes, you know, and um, hmm. so yeah, that I, is true. Yeah, I guess I never thought of it that way. Yeah, it, it man, it, it has taken me literal years to to come to understand these <laughs> some things, you know. If I if I go back and look at myself from ten years ago, just starting in this, uh, I would slap myself like, dude. You're 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 doing this completely wrong. But you know, everyone everyone is a beginner at something at some point. So you can't can't be too harsh on noobs <laughs> too much. You know. Um, okay, so I want to ask you. You, I saw that you wrote a book called How to Move and Work in Japan. This is on Amazon. I did. I did. Um, it's it was my first foray into writing. So I. It's um, it's a good guide of how to get here it's a bit technical so it's not really um telling a story or anything there's some parts that are a bit of a narrative so that's cool but it's really just a a step-by-step how-to guide of e companies that are that are good to apply to to get here if you want a quick way in and the two some of the basic bare bones tools that you'll need it's made for like absolute newbies who mm -hmm. have no clue what to do, how to get to Japan, um, and like I said, I'm not I'm not a uh, trained writer or anything. So it was my first my first di uh, toe dip into that. So you may not read the best, but it's uh, from people who have purchased the book. They they have said that it's very helpful. So that's good. Huh, yeah, it looks like it was. Per I was looking up here on Amazon. Mm. You wrote it in 2016. That's rather. Mm -hmm. recent. Mm -hmm. Wow. I mean, I mean, what motivated you to make it? It was it just like you was something you wish that you had or. Yeah. Like, I mean, I wouldn't trade what I did for anything, but it is nice to kind of have a guide to, to know what to do, to learn from. And there, even throughout the various stages of my YouTube channel, I've always had the mind of trying to help people who want to come here. And because if I could do it, I thought anyone could do it. And I wanted to show that. So YouTube videos, 
the book and now the podcast, I mean, these are just different outlets for me to, to do that, to, to help people who want to come here for whatever reason, whatever reason they have, doesn't matter to me. Um, I just want them to know that you can do it. You know, it's, it, it sounds like kind of motivational fluff bullshit, but it's true. I mean, I, I'm a firm believer that if you set your mind to do something, you can accomplish it. And, um, you just have to have the motivation and the drive to do it. You know? I mean, sometimes I've like, I've often thought about writing books, but I never really, this is only a digital book, right? Or is it a print? Yeah. It's it's Kindle only. Um, I haven't thought about making it a paperback or anything. Okay. Uh, So like popular, it did uh, it. If it became more popular, if it became popular, I see. Yeah, it's not it's not exactly a bestseller, but it does it does get a steady a steady um, what what should I say a, a steady stream of purchasers. I guess there there is a steady stream of customers that that buy the book. So, um, but if it became more popular, I would I would consider that. I, I have considered writing more books uh, just to one to hone my skill because it's a skill that I'd like to improve on. And uh, two, there are different areas, more fo- more focused areas that I'd like to talk about as well. So, yeah, no, I mean, that's writing books about. I mean, you didn't. Ri- oh, let me ask you this: did, you didn't write it for like one person in particular, did you? No, no, I I just had the the general person who would like to come to Japan in mind. Okay, because like you, you said that you manage a Kaiwa places. It wasn't like something like, man, here's this noob. I really wish he had some advice. You know, <laughs> no, um, wasn't anything like that. No, to be honest, the the people that work work for me, um, they have no clue about the book or anything. So um, they're actually doing quite all right for they. they they have a much better head on their shoulders than I did when I first came here. So in 10 years, I'm, I'm curious to see where they'll be when they're, a, you know, I would say they're about two years into it mm-hmm. and they're at the level that I was about five years into it. So, I mean, they're, they're a little bit ahead of the game. So it's, it's kind of cool seeing some people who are really switched on in that sense, you know? Right. Yeah. Okay. So I I kind of wanted to talk about like who motiv- motivated you to make YouTube videos because you said that well, we were talking off the record here, so to say, uh, about how you used to have like tons of videos on YouTube a lot about hiking and yeah yeah. So, um, to be honest, my goal was never to be a J vlogger like that's not something that I was really I, I, I didn't even know about it about that scene so to speak and until I started making YouTube videos about living here um, but once I started doing videos I started noticing recommended videos from other Japan based YouTubers and so I started following some of them um, one guy, Kurt Bell, he was um, really motivating for the hiking. I always just yeah. enjoyed his his hiking videos, just out in Japan. And now Softy he's Papa. Yeah, yeah, Softy Papa. He's out in uh, California now, and um, he was really into like philosophy and and thinking. And I, I find a lot of hikers are very similar, have a very similar mindset because when you're out there in the wilderness, you have a lot of time to just think about things, and um, I, I related to that. So those hiking videos were, were inspired by him, I guess. The, um, the other videos I made were more not based on, were not um, influenced by any other J vloggers, so to speak. It was just my own motivations for coming, and I wanted to share that. So so you mean there's nobody like that said man i want to make a video just like that guy you just sort of you just kind of had this motivation that like that made you want to record your experiences or yeah, yeah pretty much okay That's, yeah uh I, I mean of course i i watched a lot of people but and there were certain k- 
camera tricks or certain things that I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. Maybe I'll try that. But it w it wasn't necessarily um, I wanted to role model after a certain person. That that wasn't it. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you this: When was the first time when you started noticing people in Japan making videos like yourself? After I started uploading, you actually, to be honest with you, the first YouTube video I uploaded was before uh, I had already been to Japan. Mm -hmm. and I moved back to the states, and it was when I was still in that transition, coming back to Japan. I was really into Japanese study at the time, so I was I was getting books, and I did a book review on a book that I had bought in Japan, made for Japanese learners in Japan. And I did a book review, and there was a guy I followed. Um, God, I forgot his I, Moses something, but he's a uh, I forgot his YouTube, Lao Shu something, but he, he's, he's a polyglot. He speaks so many languages. Polyglot is someone who speaks more than two or three languages, I think. Oh, and I didn't know that. Yeah, he, he's a guy, I don't, th I don't know if he's lived abroad, but his wife is Chinese, but he, okay. lives, in, he lives in America, and he just, he, ha he, he is self-taught over 30 languages, I believe. And really? he makes videos where he calls leveling up, where he just goes and speaks to native speakers of a particular language. And these are like one to two hour long videos. Well, back then, back in 2010, I believe is when I made my first YouTube video. Um, he was doing some reviews and that's, I guess that particular video was a motivation for me to put up, put one up and, and uh, he saw it and he enjoyed it. So I, I guess I was in like the language study niche at the beginning, but then I kind of branched out once I came back. So branched out from language study to more general stuff about Japan and and exploring. I was all about it, about exploring. Right. I mean, yeah. we talked a little bit off the record again. Here, <laughs> well, we didn't talk that much. We just talked a little bit through text. But <laughs> we were talking about a podcast, that, or I was talking about a podcast that you made where you were, we were talking about the J-Vlogging community. Oh, and yeah. What's your opinion on all that? Uh, well. I guess as a whole. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I, I, I've mentioned it before. but Yeah, I couldn't find this podcast for the life yeah. of me. I mean, I'll, I'll probably find it here right after this. but I'll, I'll be completely... 100% honest. I want you to be honest. So. Yeah, I don't have a personal problem with any person who makes J vlogs. Mm -hmm. That's just not what I want to do. Oh, and yeah, that's I don't, that's I don't not think something does. I want to relate to. Like, if you want to make a video about some strange food you found at a Kambini or some Pokemon festival you went to or something like that, by all means, if, if that's what you're interested in, showcase it. To me, that's cool. If that's what you're into, I'm I'm all for people promoting things that they like to do. Mm -hmm. That's just not my scene. And what I found, and I'm glad that I didn't join in on this, is there's a lot of it's very clickish in the J vlogging scene. And yeah. like and I, I I honestly, I'm like you know. I'm done with high school bullshit. I'm an adult now. I don't want to be a part of stupid bullshit like that. So um, no offense to, to people in the JVlog community, but I just don't want to be a part of it. And just because I'm, I make videos and podcasts in Japan doesn't mean I'm a part of that. If, if, sorry, if that makes me a part of that group, then so be it. But that's not my goal is to be a part of that group. So I, I have no allegiance to it. I have no, I'm, I'm in very, I wouldn't say apathetic. I'm just indifferent to it, you know. So, right. Yeah. Well, that's the interesting thing about, I mean, life on the internet nowadays. We were talking about this at the beginning of the show, mm. but it just seems like there's a lot more money in being offended nowadays. <laughs> like, oh yeah, oh you yeah. Know what I'm yeah. saying it's just it, like like there wasn't this before. I mean, I think the only reason why there's more money in it is probably because these companies on the internet like newspaper not just newspapers but uh i don't know gossip channels whatever 
they just need more content, right? And so what's what gets people's attention is that somebody was offended by one thing. And it gets to this point where like the stuff on Twitter, I mean, which I like Twitter because you always get updates and everything. And I'm slowly getting more into it than I am than using Facebook. I'm kind of growing away from Facebook recently. But like with Twitter, it's it's just sort of like there's all the soundbite information that you don't really get the full context of what everybody's yeah. talking about. I, I understand exactly what you're saying. And I've kind of moved in the same exact direction that you have. I've, I've kind of left Facebook in the dust. To me, Facebook is like third tier for me, but I've really got into Twitter just in the past year, I guess. And um, it, what I find interesting about Twitter is you can you can get access to content much easier. Like the timeline, they figured out timeline perfectly, I think. Instagram is still confusing as hell. Facebook is horrible at it. Um, I just think that Twitter has has the, the timeline done great because it's compact and it's 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 just right there and uh, I I found the most value in terms of what I get from social media from Twitter as opposed to Facebook. The only reason I have a Facebook now is just to stay in touch with family. Oh like, yeah, yeah, of course. You know, yeah. I, I don't I don't really like promoting stuff on Facebook or anything, but I use a lot of um, alternative social media even though it's not really popular, it's not mainstream, but I, I prefer to use alternative social media. Twitter's, Twitter's probably the most mainstream social media that I'll promote my stuff on, but I, I usually use it just to sort of keep up with what's going on in the world. And sometimes I, I'll take a break from just news because as an American, I get tired of hearing about Trump bullshit all the time. So um, I, I just don't care anymore. Um, I took like a week off and it was so nice not to hear about Trump for a week. And then <laughs> I get back into it, like, orange oh, man on your Twitter. Same feed. <laughs> shit again. And I'm like, okay, I know yeah. why I took a break. So, you know, well, there's a lot of money in hating Trump. So that's probably yeah. why it exists. And, you know, to be honest, you're right. I mean, either there people there are people out, especially on YouTube too. There are people that are pro Trump and people who are anti Trump, and it's like, okay, that's your that's your thing. You get you get viewers, you got your your audience, but yeah. And but I will say this: it doesn't matter what side of the fence you're on. I think everyone has a right to speak what they believe, and. Mm. Um, I'm, this might be a really unpopular opinion, but the the no, whole uh, Alex Jones thing, I think it's it's a dangerous precedent to set doing that. What 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 uh, the social media sites did to him because, like, I don't agree with him. I think he's a lunatic. But if you silence people who you disagree with, that sets a sets a precedent later on where it could come back and bite you in the ass too. You know, so you you got to be careful what you do with that. That's just my take on it. Didn't yeah, mean to no. derail that conversation, but uh, that that's that's where it led me to. <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. Well, I mean, uh, that's it's it's uh well, well. Interesting thing about that though yeah. is, it seems like I don't really think that's like the first precedent of like somebody like where a big company like YouTube or Twitter where they just remove someone. I mean, I mean, maybe it's the first precedent where like a big name gets removed. Like yeah. you remember that Reply Girl stuff? Do you remember that on YouTube? Uh, no, um, I, I'm I'm actually not familiar with that. What what was Reply that? Girl was like this girl with like this low cut dress and like her boob sticking out. Well, not actual sticking out, but like just her cleavage was showing, mm. and she'd reply to all these people, right? You know, it was just spam basically. Right. And YouTube kind of just you know they took the axe and they they axed that out. I mean, another example is like how. You remember the, you remember Elsa Gate that happened more, oh, yeah. more recently? Yeah, like that's, all that's those another weird YouTube video. Yeah, yes, yes. That see, I'm I'm not sure about that because you know I I, I run a kids a kids English school and we have you know sometimes we have YouTube songs playing in the background and I notice one of those weird <laughs> videos pop up and like no I'm that. Out off the TV because it's it's so weird because like 
it starts off pretty innocently. Yeah, and then yeah, it, it does. More bizarre, and it's just, <laughs> and even the kids were just like, you know, saying like, "This is gross. This is weird." And I'm like, "Yeah, I agree. I'm gonna turn this off." You know, so it's uh, it, it's it's weird. I don't know whether YouTube should ban that or not because. Well, they totally did. I mean, like they want they yeah. want like balls out, like trying to get rid of that stuff. Yeah, which if it's spam and it's made by bots mm -hmm. and and such, then yeah, get rid of it because it's not a it's not a human being. But well, some of that's automation. You yeah, know? It, but if there's no actual crime committed, then you can't really say. But then again, you know, people say, well, yeah, these social media sites are private companies mm -hmm. so they have a right to do what they want and i agree with that you're right they do have a right but um i'm a, i'm i'm a man i'm a man of principles i guess and I, I just think free speech is one of the most fundamental principles that all human beings have and even if i completely 100 percent disagree with something that someone says i'll 100 percent support them in their right to express that opinion that's just where I stand on it, but it gets right. to a weird area when you get these like videos that target children. You know, that's uh, that that starts <laughs> that starts uh, upsetting me a bit. And but I'm like, okay, well, has there any been any crime committed against the kids? No. Well, as much as I don't like it, you know, you gotta. Right. I mean, you know, you know, Fight Club, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Like, I to me, like some of that Elsa Gate stuff, it seemed like. You, at first, you're thinking, oh, this is like Tyler Durden bullshit, you know, mm -hmm. like kind of slipping in, you know, X-rated movies into kids programs or something. Right. But That's then been going on forever, though, Rin and Stimpy, yeah. you know, like Rocco's yeah, Modern I'm not, Life. Not I'm, I'm not saying that that's what this is. I'm saying yeah. what's creepy about this is that it's automated and it's ah. just like it's I don't know. It kind of like makes my head spin when I think about it, because it's like basically these videos were created only because of SEOs. Um, search engine optimization, like certain keywords that they knew kids were clicking on. So, Matt, so instantly these SEO tags, somehow these people, they bought into like Google AdWords and they figured out that these certain tags were popular with kids' videos. And so they started mixing them all in together. <laughs> yeah, that, it, it's bizarre. really bizarre. You're right. It's real bizarre. And part of me finds it upsetting, but another part of me is really fascinated with where. AI is going in that respect and I'm and I'm thinking it's it as weird as it is that's kind of fascinating that AI has evolved to do something like that you know and it's it's almost a little bit creepy of where that sort of AI can go in the future you know yeah it really is i mean <laughs> I'm not. I'm not sure what where where it's gonna be in like the next ten years, but it would be interesting. Yeah, man. Just looking back, you know, I think ten years ago is not that long ago. But in terms of the internet, you gotta you gotta look like Facebook was just starting to boom ten years ago. Twitter mm. was very in its infancy. Yeah, you know, like, no, like anyone knew about Twitter. Yeah. When did Instagram? Come out? I don't even remember when that came out, but. Um, it's back when they had those shitty filters for all of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and you know, and just, what was it ten years ago when iPhones started coming out? So just in ten years, things have radically changed so yeah. much, and it's um, it's hard to imagine how, at the pace that it's going. What ten years from now, what the what everything's going to be like, you know? So um, it's both. Interesting, fascinating, but also a little scary if if you're not sure where it's headed, you know. Well, I mean, one of the interesting things is like with uh, uh, like with Twitter, like when Twitter and YouTube were created, I have this impression because I don't know. I guess call this conspiracy, but basically, when these things were made, the creators had no idea what it is and what it, they wanted to make with it. Because I, I get this impression, like. Even the I remember reading something from the CEO of Twitter, and him like trying to tweet to like understand like so is this how I use this? <laughs> I bought some milk. Hashtag delicious. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Well, 
that's how a lot of things are, man, at the very beginning, yeah. you know, yeah. um, and, and starting, starting a, um, starting a business you, in the first couple of years, it's pivotal. You, you don't really know where you're going with it. It's imagine yeah, like true. you're steering a ship in uncharted waters mm-hmm. and you're not sure if taking this direction or that direction is the right way to go, mm-hmm. but you just got to trust you, what information you have and your instincts pretty much. And sometimes it's not the right direction and sometimes it is. And it, that, that's how I liken early on in a business is, is like steering a ship into unknown waters is you just don't know where it's going to go or what's going to happen, how it's going to take off. You know? Yeah, that's true. I mean, whereas like something like Facebook, I have this idea that Mark Zuckerberg probably definitely had an idea where he was going, or at least that's my impression. I don't know. He seems that's robotic right. enough to be programmed to understand that. So <laughs> he likes to socially engineer people. So of course he. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. I'm not sure if he actually said that. I only heard that through the grapevine. Yeah, I, I, know, I know he called people who use Facebook Facebook dumb fucks. That's that's uh, <laughs> what I did not hear that. <laughs> dude, he did. This was like way back in I was years ago, but he um <laughs> he basically said that uh I forgot the entire conversation, but he basically said, Yeah, they're dumb fucks. So Yeah. Sorry, I, I just just to uh, just ask, how are, how is your channel about language? I'm not I'm not. Oh, sure it's fine. No, no, that's no, fine. I mean, it's, it's rated E for explicit. Okay, <laughs> not, not all right. Forever. Yeah, my, mine's mine's an open book, so you're you're free to say what yeah, you want. No, no, no. But, um, I just wasn't sure about yours, but no, no. I mean, I mean, I pref- I don't like censorship. I'm not a fan of censorship either. Okay. Actually, okay. I kind of wanted to talk about the Alex Jones thing, but you're going to talk about it anyway. Um, yeah. yeah. No, what I kind of my take about that is. Uh, a lot of what happened behind, I think what the problem is, is we don't really know exactly what happened because most of these companies, they didn't really tell us why they were doing it, you know, why they were dropping Alex Jones. Mm. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't know if you watch Philip DeFranco, but I watch him every day now. Uh, he made a really good point. He was saying that Twitter does, they have like guidelines and rules and regulations, but they don't like point at a video or like an example of saying, see, don't do this, you know? So it's it's very confusing when they do something like this. And I think maybe that probably Twitter and Facebook, when they dropped Alex Jones, they were probably thinking like, well, we know this is going to be polarized, but we're going to do it anyway. You know, it'll make the news, but that's okay. I think yeah. it was very carefully orchestrated. Personally. Well, I'll, I'll give Twitter credit in some sense is they were the last to drop him because uh, you know uh, Jack Dorsey the CEO he said um, you know Alex Jones hasn't actually violated any of our terms of service if he were to do so then we would take action well apparently that he, that? yeah that's oh, okay. what that's what he said when all these other sites dropped him um, apparently he did and what got him kicked off was a uh, he, I don't know if it was the where he confronted Mark Rubio, uh, or or oh, not. Yeah, I saw it, that. Was, it was it was that day is what he said that day. But I thought, what a strange, yeah. what a strange thing. What did he actually violate? What terms did he actually violate? And they said that he violated Twitter's terms of service for bullying or or something like that. And I thought, mm, that's a that's a that could be interpreted many different ways. Um, I think they were just looking for an excuse. To be oh, honest yeah. with you, um, yeah. but to me, all that does is like Alex Jones is like a dumpster fire, and banning him from all these things is just going to put more gasoline on top of it. You know, maybe so you, he's not going to go away. He's only going to become louder. And you think he'll find another uh, place to? Yes, show his show? I mean, he. I mean, what was it? His. Um, his, his, uh, not his YouTube, whatever service that he offers on his website, his subscriptions shot up like by a million subscribers after he was banned. That's a lot. That's, I mean, that's, that's quite a lot. I wish I had that many subscribers, you know what I mean? But um, you just gotta, you gotta have a show where you just spout nonsense all day. (laughs) Uh, about uh, inter- intergalactic child molesters and And turning frogs gay. And yeah, yeah. (laughs) I mean, I, to be honest, 
I honestly think all that kind of nonsense is a, a show he does. It's a character that he plays. I'm sure he believes Probably. a lot of the stuff that he says, but you know, a lot of it is theatrics, to be honest with you. Um, but he has a loyal following, and just like just like Trump, the more you criticize it and the more you try and shut it up, the the stronger his followers will become. And so you're just mm -hmm. enabling them to become more vocal, I think. So it's, it's very counterintuitive, very counterproductive what they're doing with this. And um, it's like uh, also the Streisand effect. Have you heard about that? Yeah, it's for yeah. like she released her nudes and she didn't want anybody to know about her. Or she didn't like people that, that they're releasing her nudes and that they, so she went to court. But then, like, they backfired because... Yeah, it's the same uh, concept, but... Because I everybody... I, I, I sure as hell hope Barbra Streisand didn't release any nude photos, but uh, I think no, it was... No, like, there's some guy who was, like, trying to, like... He was threatening to release them, and then Barbra Streisand said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sue them, that way they don't do it. But because she threatened to sue, that made the news. And so now everybody knows about that she has nude pictures. <laughs> well, whether it was nude pictures or not... The concept anyway, is just saying, like, I like, like I said, having context. That's all. Yeah, yeah, like, like I said, I sure as hell hope there aren't any nude photos floating around a <laughs> Barbra Streisand, but you know, I don't, I don't care. Really. <laughs> I, I'm I'm not going to look them up. Um, yeah, but if that's what she wants to do, more power to her. But anyway, uh, yeah, saying, it's, it's, the same, it's the same concept, you know. Like, uh, if the more you try and shut something up, the more it's the the louder it's going to become, and that and that that's the thing, you know. Don't try and, especially with the internet now, don't try and shut up people you disagree with or because they're just going to become louder and they're just going to dig in even more, I think. And you don't want that. You don't want the people who follow Alex Jones to become physically active. You know what I mean? Right. You don't want them to, 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 to lash out at people. Now yeah. he he's gone on record saying to peacefully protest people. That's his words. So uh, he's not himself inciting violence, but who knows what some of the crazier people who are part of his audience will do? You know. Possibly, I don't know. I'm uh, I'm 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 pretty sure. I mean, don't you think that a lot of like what went behind closed doors? I mean, the decision to get rid of him was probably a lot due to money. I'm Maybe. more interested in that, but I don't know. Yeah, well, uh, you know, then there's a lot of people who say he's a gatekeeper and he's a sort of uh, he's sort of in bed with all of them anyway. So, but you know, we could go down so many conspiracy rabbit holes if we wanted to. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> really, sure. Yeah, I don't want this to be about the podcast about Alex Jones. Maybe I'll move yeah, on yeah. here. I mean, I don't. Yeah. I was only talking about J vlogging, and the thing about J vlogging, it seems like nowadays that um, everybody has to sort of follow some trend. Or mm. follow the news, or follow whatever's big out there. What's yeah. the big like? Kind of. <laughs> the, I hate saying this, but like the trickle down, you have to catch up from like what the big people are dropping down, and like hopefully you catch some views. Um, yeah, or it, what it reminds me of is when there was a lot of drama in 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 that community, and people would make videos about that, commenting about it. It's like you're just. Like a leech sucking on to try, you know, on the something that's a topic that shouldn't even really be talked about because it should be personal business between people, but they've made it public on YouTube, you know, and you're just trying to siphon views off of it. Now, I, I'll admit, years ago, I made a few videos that would try and capitalize off of news that have happened, or uh, I made a response video. Like, honestly, response videos. I have no problem with. If you have an opposing view to somebody, you should express it. Definitely. But to only make the video just to capitalize off of a pop another popular video, mm -hmm. I think is is a little bit uh that's I don't really agree with that strategy, you know? Yeah, no I mean it just I guess recently like with this show, I've been trying to like push it and get more uh more of a following. Mm -hmm. uh, and like release something every week and and so on. That's good. Uh, man. Yeah. 
Yeah, but I'm I'm starting to find out that like a lot of my friends and like people who do this YouTube thing, they all have to like kind of attach themselves to the bigger people in order to just get noticed. Like I have one friend who's an artist here in Japan, like he does like comic books, right? And does a like, kind of manga stuff. Yeah. And at this like kind of it was all it was a he was a foreigner. And there's this uh, manga I guess convention or something here in Tokyo for all foreigners. And the one, the one manga that got the most attention, that had the most people around the table, was the manga for Bart Kira. You know, the mixture of Bart Simpson and uh, Akira, Akira. The, the manga. I, I, was thinking, I kind of enjoyed those a little bit, but yeah, that's just... <laughs> yeah, but I'm just saying, it's like, it's name brand recognition. Yeah. You know, it's like, I hate it, but at the same time, I do think it's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> well, because I like The Simpsons, and I like Akira, so it's like, mm, that's a good mashup, but... It's not original, you know? Yeah. And I mean, like, you, you, I'm sitting here with, like, my friend. I could just reveal him. He's a friend of the show. Chris Carlier. He does the comic book called Life uh, Little in Japan. Okay. Um, <laughs> I like the name, though. That's good. Yeah, he, yeah. Was the sec he was the second guest on this show. It's actually one of the most watched episodes, only because it has a thumbnail of Hitomi Tanaka, if you know who that is. Yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, because he, he met her and he got a picture taken with her. But anyway... Long story short, um, here we have we have somebody like who's doing something original, but nobody's paying attention to it. I mean, like maybe there's a few like walk by, like hey, that's kind of cool, and then they they like the title, and then that's about it. Yeah, actually, though, I've I'll I have to admit a guilty pleasure of mine is seeing YouTube dumpster fires or YouTube like people who like ruin their lives on YouTube <laughs> and they they oh boy catalog it like. There's yeah. a couple of examples I can give. One of them is in Japan. Uh, it's this uh, this dude called like Hiding in My Room or something. Oh, that guy. Yeah, yeah. I watched him. Yeah, he, He's <laughs> unintentionally hilarious. I, I just love seeing how much he fucks up. And, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, another one, kind of, like I met this guy years ago before his YouTube channel took off. And if he kept doing what he was actually doing, he, that's fine and, and, and cool, but he took a weird turn. And that's, it's not uh, happy in Japan, is it? No, it was uh, <laughs> Nobita. Yeah, that's happy in Japan. Oh, is that happy in Japan? That's happy okay. In Japan. The guy I, thought, did the that, I thought he was like, find your love in Japan. Did yeah, he change so it? Dumb. Sorry, was it find yeah. your love in Japan? That's yeah, what, yeah, yeah. Find your love in Japan. In Japan. I when I met him, he was really just interested in talking to foreigners about he was just really, he seemed genuine about interested in talking to foreigners, why they came here and, and like trying to introduce people to, you know, if they wanted to find a girlfriend or boyfriend or something, you know, like that sort of thing. And I'm like, okay, cool. That's, that's your, to me, he just seemed like he, he was trying to copy Yuta. Oh, um, that guy, Japanese Yuta did. Yeah, that, that Japanese guy, his. Yuta. He seemed like he was trying to copy that style, but he did kind of make it his own in a, in a way. So that's cool. But then he started like, going off the rails i'm like oh shit this guy's gone full-blown like racist or something you know so <laughs> like what with dear black people and everything yeah yeah like <laughs> makes the news and, he hates gays and black i don't know if he actually hates gays and blacks but he he seemed to make videos that painted himself in a very negative light in that regard and i just thought if you want views you're gonna get them you know so yeah i was wondering why he went that way too that was really weird <laughs> yeah and the the best one though, it, he's he wasn't even even involved with Japan at all. But he was in Cambodia. There was a student named Nojo Coward that okay. moved to Cambodia to become a MMA fighter to like fight Muay Thai, and he trained for that. And he he was actually on Cambodian TV, and he fought a few fights and he lost. And he broke his hand in a fight, and then he couldn't afford to get his hand fixed. Mm -hmm. So instead, he got involved with like this crowd of people who, like, he got addicted to drugs, and then he like tried to commit suicide, and um, he dated a a transgender person in Cambodia, and had okay. all that, and like it was just watching this guy fuck up his life and go down the road he did. It was just, I don't know, I find, for some reason, I find entertainment in these people. Not the fact that it's bad things happening to them, but the fact that they feel like they can just put it out there. They're putting it out on YouTube for a reason. 
Uh, yeah, I don't know. You know Maybe it's like it's, it's like a tragedy or something. Yeah, yeah, and I don't know. Like, it's it's kind of like I know it's not good, but it's you know sort of like if you like um, reality TV, you know it's kind of trash TV, but you still kind of enjoy it deep down as a guilty pleasure in a way. So, yeah, that is true. I mean, there's a very amateur quality to yeah. YouTube where you you see depictions of somebody's life being displayed. Yeah. Sometimes real t- in real time, uh, and how they kind of change, and which which also kind of weird about YouTube is how, like, how people change to like fit certain platforms. Like for example, you're probably a lot different than how it is you're on Instagram. Like you probably take different kind of pictures, you know, yeah. or or like what you write on Facebook might be different from what you write on Twitter. Yeah, yeah you're right. I mean, I'm more vocally outspoken on Twitter because it's mostly word, but Instagram, I keep it strictly to photos that I like taking in Japan. You know, I don't, Mm -hmm. I really don't do any, anything else for my Instagram. Cause for me, that was the purpose of Instagram is to take pictures, not to put memes up or anything. So people do that and that's fine, but that's Mm -hmm. just not what I use it for. What is it that you feel is a topic that often defines your channel on YouTube? Mm. Nature? Podcast? I would say anything and everything. Like I, I don't really define my channel too much, but I would say the main theme that comes up a lot is helping people um, get to Japan in the sense of showing others who have come to Japan and have succeeded in Japan and have stuck it out and not left after a year or two and just sort of made their own way here. That's, um, that's, that's what I hope to do is inspire people to, if they want to come here, look at these guys, they've done it. And I, I try and show such a very an eclectic array of different people. That have, right. that have come here and, and succeeded just to say, you know, they've all done the same thing. They're all very different people, but they've all done what you're thinking about. So what are you waiting for? Come and do it yourself. Make your own journey here, you know? Yeah, right, right. I mean, yeah, that's a good, that's a good message. I mean, I guess I, I've, I've always, like, considered my uh, my position on YouTube. I've actually given it a lot of thought recently. <laughs> last couple of days. Uh, I mean, I'm mostly going to focus on film and filmmaking because, I mean, that's part of what I like about doing YouTube. And I'll probably make a vlog about this at some point. But part of what I like about it is it gives me this opportunity to share things with people that, mm-hmm. like, I mean, it's it's hard to even think about this, but there was a time when you couldn't share something with someone. You know, it's like, oh, I watched this guy stand up. He's so funny. Or I saw, I don't know, who's a famous comedian? Bill Burr. Mm -hmm. I saw Bill Burr. He was so funny. And, like, nowadays you can just type in Bill Burr on Google and you can, like, watch his whole stand-up or Netflix or whatever, right? Yeah. So, I mean, today it's so – I mean, well, back then it was so cool to me that you could actually, like, put something on – I mean, nowadays it's even better. But you could put so much stuff on the Internet you could actually share it with someone. Yeah, uh, and and that kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier is, you know, the internet is such an awesome thing if used how you want it to, you know, because what what I the one thing I learned previously with my YouTube channel before was there's there's an audience for everything. Mm-hmm. I didn't think at the time I didn't think what I was putting out was you know, I liked it. And, and I hoped other people liked it, but then I started getting more and more subscribers and more views, and I thought, hey, I'm just being me, and people like that. So there is an audience for everything out there. So what what I, the best advice I give to people who want to put something out on the Internet, whether YouTube or podcast or anything, is just be authentic and be yourself because you will find an audience if you just keep at it. you got to just keep doing it, you know? Well, I'm out of questions. Uh, anything you want to ask me before we call? Yeah, it, yeah, call man. It, call um, it a podcast. Well, we've we've been we've been going at this for a little while, but um, 
Yeah, um, you're quite okay. What yeah. motivated you to start your YouTube channel and podcast? Since you asked me uh, the same thing. Yeah, no, I mean, the first thing was the reason why I started it was number one, my goal was to send something to my friends and family, mm -hmm. basically just saying, hey, I'm alive and this is Japan. Check it out. And it Did was you around started that after time. The, uh, the earthquake, the Tohoku earthquake. Oh, no, no. Yeah, I started in 2009, actually. Oh, okay. So before first, that then. Oh. Yeah, in January, actually. Yeah. When I first got here. Um, and there was a friend of mine who I was going to school with. Actually, I probably should start way before this. When I first started making, I don't know, when I when I was first coming to Japan, I found out about this school named Temple University, Japan, mm -hmm. TUJ as it's called. And if you type on the internet, there was a few people who were actually making vlogs. There was one guy named uh, Atomic Boy X. He also goes by FYI Tokyo uh, now. And then there was another guy named International Ace. They both made blo uh, video blogs about how they're going to Temple University of Japan. And I kind of followed them for a little bit. And it was, I can't tell you how exciting it was, you know, seeing these people in the flesh, like in real life. It was like meeting a celebrity. Right. <laughs> um, and while meeting these celebrities at the school, one of them was it uh, Greg Atomic Boy X now FYI Tokyo uh, he introduced me says hey I'm going out to meet a bunch of YouTubers I'm going to meet uh, my Argonauts Cruxe and Hiko Simon I had no idea who these people were right everybody knows Hiko Simon if you don't know Hiko Simon then you're invited to leave but yeah. <laughs> anyway um, no, Simon so the Hiko Simon's a cool dude yeah uh, yeah, and so I met up with these people, and I, I was introduced to this whole world of, like, all these people, all these vloggers, yeah. like, Eco Simon, Gimme Breakman, TQ Sam, all these people, mm -hmm. and it just, it opened the doors, like, just me being able to meet all these new people, and the goal for me at that point kind of became, like, wow, I could, I could make enough videos, and I could meet enough people, and I, I won't ever feel, like, lonely, you know, quote mm. unquote, in Japan, because that's like a big thing everybody always talks about being living in Japan as foreigners is that the loneliness is real, you know, right? <laughs> right. So after a certain point, I kind of plateaued. It was like around 2011. I plateaued a bit because I met everybody, and their YouTube was kind of at a weird state at 2011. They didn't really know what they wanted to be at that point, and then they opened up YouTube Space and Ropongi and. Yeah, nothing happened for like a good couple of years. And then what's his name? Abroad in Japan came out and uh, I never really wa liked his videos because I always thought they were too polished or too well put together and they got all these views. Mm. I mean, I understand why he got the views, but it's to me, it's like, I don't want to watch this. It's too mainstream. <laughs> right, right. So and then more <clears throat> mainstream people started popping up again, like people like Charla in Japan and Rachel in June and uh Tex in Tokyo and all maybe maybe you're familiar with these names I don't know um and eventually they came out and then I had more of an inspiration to start making content again when I started listening to podcasts yeah you know when it just like it became something simple like oh I watched Mad Men tonight but I have nobody to talk to about it and nobody's going to talk about it. <laughs> so I would just like type go into like iTunes or YouTube and I type in like Mad Men or something episode recap and there'd be some people on the internet just talking about it. So that kind of rekindled my interest in YouTube and podcast or I guess podcast is a new thing. No, everybody's making yeah. a podcast nowadays. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think to be honest, uh, podcasts have for me have been super inspirational too. Um, my dad was in radio for years. And I never, I was always too young to, to really get into it when he was in radio, but my brother was in high school and he was put on the night shift at the local radio station where my dad managed. And, um, I was like, wow, that's kind of cool. He was the night DJ, you know? And then, uh, but I never really gave it thought, but I know I enjoyed listening to podcasts because my old job, especially before I got a car was biking i would ride my bicycle 
eight kilometers one way to work and back and I had a lot of time to kill. So I would, I would alternate between studying Japanese and listening to podcasts and I just really got into podcasts. So I've accumulated, you know, 30, 40 different podcasts that I cycle through. And, you know, nowadays I, back then, 2012, 2013, I would just listen to everything and anything I could get my hands on. Now I'm really selective. I, I'm still subscribed to a lot of them, but I probably listen to just one or two a week that I really find interest in, I guess. So. Right, right. Yep, well, that's where we are today. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm hoping, like you said, like the two things that are too polished and too mainstream just have no soul, I think. <laughs> you know, they, they're just, they're, they're good. It's like really well made, but there's just no, no soul to it for me. That's, that's, <laughs> that's the, uh, the word I like to use. Is, is that what I don't like about it? It has no soul. May, maybe, maybe, maybe if it had, had it a little bit more, um, more, more of that smooth soul in there, but, uh, I don't know, but Did you that's ever- for me. That's for me. I, I, I like really authentic sort of just people talking raw unedited sort of chats you know what i mean so, yeah no that's yeah. it feels therapeutic in a way or at least for me it does like sometimes yeah. i listen to the h3 podcast just to relax because so i feel like i'm talking with my friends they're hilarious man uh, and they've had they've had guests on there that i thought that's such a weird guest for that show but it works you know yeah so, right yeah, yeah. It really is um shit what was i gonna say I forgot, what I, gonna, <laughs> I forgot what i was gonna say yeah um Oh, now I remember what I was going to say. Um, did you ever see a movie called Amazon Women on the Moon or From the Moon? I've heard of it. I have not watched it yet. But it sounds like... <laughs> they, have this one, they have this one segment of called Black People Born with No Soul. Right? <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just, I have this part where they have David Allen Greer, a black guy, and he's like singing all these white people <laughs> songs. It just makes me think of that when you say YouTubers with no soul. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, I mean, I, I hope you understand what I mean by that. No, I, so, I do 100% right. understand. It's just like it conjures up an idea in my mind of like people just making videos for the sake of just making videos. You well, know? yeah, because that's, that's what YouTube <laughs> used to be when it started was just people engaging in this sort of thing, right? And then it mm-hmm. like YouTube really took off and companies started putting that out their own YouTube channels and now it's just become really um, like a mainstream outlet. But, um, podcasting, I, I still think as much, as much mainstream podcasts that are out there, I still think it's sort of a little bit of the wild west in terms of entertainment for the internet, you know, cause oh, yeah. there, there really isn't like a precedent set for podcasts. It's still anything goes in terms of how the format is for podcast. And, and I think that's really cool. You, the creative outlet is probably the best out there for content creation, I think, or is podcast form. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that definitely helps you build connections and everything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I mean, by listening. Right, right. Well, Radri, it was uh, it was great talking to you. Thank you for having me on your show, and thanks for coming on mine. Yeah, definitely. It was fun. I mean... It's good to always, I like being interviewed and or talking to interviewers because, you know, they know how to ask questions and they know what questions to ask. What? Yeah. Well, I, to be honest, I'm just going, I'm, I'm figuring all this out on my own as well. So that's part of the fun for me is, is learning as I go. And, uh, I also wanted to know, is that a Nico Nico Doga pillow behind you? It is, it is a Nico Nico Doga. I won this thing a long time ago, actually. Yeah. <laughs> An event and uh, not a vending machine, one of those UFO catchers, yeah, like, yeah. like 2010, yeah. maybe 2009. Yeah, that is yeah. an Nico Doga, which nobody yeah. really uses in Japan anymore, not anymore. But that's how I got my first exposure to Simpsons Japanese dubs, where it was Nico Nico Doga. But oh, really, yeah, I used to, I really yeah. liked their comment section for learning internet Japanese slang. Japanese internet. Yeah, slang. Yeah. It's definitely that's definitely yeah, a good place to learn yeah. that and like Nichanadu. But <laughs> yeah, oh yeah, that's that's a, that's a whole other beast. But. That's that's a whole other topic. So yeah. usually I finish off my shows. I, I always ask the people I talk to just one thing they would like to leave off for the audience 
one thing they'd like to say and uh what would you like to to give to my audience and what would i like to give to your there. audience yeah. uh thank you for listening if you made it this far uh be sure to like all of Shay Roberts' Lone Star Under the Rising Sun podcast goods. Buy his books or his book. <laughs> cheap plug, cheap plug. Um, yeah. yeah, cheap plug. Uh, write something in the comments saying about how he's the most smart and attractive man in the world. Not at all. Um, no, I well, guess I, I guess it would just be in all seriousness. Yeah. Uh, uh, what I would say is just plug my stuff. I guess. Um, all right, you've been listening to a live recording on YouTube. This is pro we were trying to set up to get this to be on Streamlabs to make it look a little cooler so you don't see that Google uh, watermark on the top right or not top right top left hand corner. Hopefully next time will this will be on slobs. <laughs> slobs. Yes. Uh, stream was it Streamlabs? Yeah, Streamlabs OBS. Open open broadcast system or yeah. software? Was it software or system? It's one of those system all right yeah. or i think it's no i think it's software software yeah. so hopefully next time it'll be all decked out and look really cool yeah. there'll be an intro and there'll be an outro nice um, little uh, subscriber pop up and donation and all that yeah but um, also too even like when you were telling me to set up this thing before we started the x split maybe my, i see the watermarks showing up on your your end oh really but, x split yeah, the has the watermark on my end yeah, it does. I keep hmm. seeing it. It anyway. doesn't. Sh it doesn't show up on my um, my other videos. That's weird. Maybe it's just a YouTube thing. Hmm. Maybe I don't okay. know. Uh, anyway, you know, hopefully it'll be set up next time because we were yeah. trying to figure that out, but we had some technical difficulties. Well, uh, I'd yeah, like that's. To, I'd like to also say to uh, to check out all of your stuff. Uh, Why come Japan podcast? Correct. That's right. You yep. find it on iTunes. Yeah. Give us five stars. Yes, yes, both of us. Please <laughs> like our work. Um, please subscribe to Radri's YouTube channel. Uh, you're you're out on iTunes as well, so subscribe to him on iTunes if you're on the go. And is there any other social media or any sites that you'd like to promote? Yeah, that's it. I mean, I don't know. Okay. I mean, I kind it kind of feels shameless plugging this stuff, but I guess that's what you're supposed to do, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean. You have what Twitter and YouTube or Twitter, YouTube, yeah. Instagram, you know, all, all the basic stuff. So just just it's look all for in him. the description below. Yeah, I'll have all of his links in my video below. So click on them. Enjoy. Check out his other podcast. You had uh, Simon, um, not Hiko Simon, but uh, the other Simon, Simon you know. Yeah, the, the other Simon. Yeah, the uh, sorry, <laughs> sorry Simon. Um, he has his own he has his own solo show now, right? He used to be yeah, part this. of the three old. And he used to be part of three old dudes. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Simon no Chanoma, Chanoma. right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. So check out check out that the last one that was good. And his show is on now, right? I guess we're we're in. no. Actually, he messaged me. This is the shitty thing. As uh, well, means well, he's not here, so I can say this. Uh, <laughs> um, he actually made a mistake, and the show's on Sunday. So we could have ah. started at eight thirty, but that's okay. Okay. Well, no worries. Um, uh, but yeah, he's he was always cool. I always enjoyed um, talking with him. So check out his show as well. Kind of not even involved with this episode, but check him out. But uh, yeah, um, I'll lead people to your your podcast and your channel. Be sure to check Radri out. And also check out some of my previous podcasts too. I have some awesome guests. So lots of free entertainment for you all. I really, I really need an outro at this point because, like, everything is just becomes awkward separation points. No, I'm just, we'll just leave it at that. You, you could just end it with a giant, loud fart sound, and that would, that would work, right? <laughs> I could always edit that in, you know, <laughs> if you want. Yeah, yeah. So, anyway, man, thanks for, thanks for having me on, and thanks for being on mine. I appreciate it. Yeah. Oh, uh, I guess next week on the Why Come Japan show is. Victor, also known as Fox, not Gimme Breakman Victor, the other Victor. <laughs> Maybe you wouldn't appreciate that moniker. Just Victor. Kanto Kitsune used to be on uh, YouTube a while ago. This is, he's the Instagram handle, Frame of Travel. He's a photographer on Instagram. Great guy. Be on the show next week. All right, cool. The schedule will be out soon. Great. 
Thanks, man. Peace. All right. Catch you later, guys. Bye.